President Yoon Jong-il held his first meeting with senior secretaries. He emphasized all-out efforts should be made to tackle soaring costs, a key task of the new administration. In order to restore ties with Japan, President Yoon met with the Japanese delegation comprised of parliament members. He shared his vision to improve the bilateral relations. The U.S. says Russian President Vladimir Putin is preparing for a long war in Ukraine. It seems likely he could turn to more drastic means. Hello and welcome. I'm Daniel Che here to bring the latest. Let's begin with our top story. South Korea's new president met with senior secretaries and stressed the importance of bringing down soaring consumer prices. On Wednesday morning, he became the first Korean leader in history to commute to work. Yoon Jung-min starts us off. The president clocking in for work, a scene never seen before in Korean history. President Yoon song yeol commuted to his office in Yongsan Wednesday morning from his private home in Sochogo district. Meeting reporters on his way to work, President Yoon stressed the importance of national unity and integration. On his second day in office, President Yoon held his first meeting with his senior secretaries. He first discussed the country's economic difficulties with soaring costs due to the war in Ukraine and other global issues affecting people's livelihoods. On the issue of compensating small business owners hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, President Yoon said they need financial help as soon as possible. The president said the national security situation is also difficult. He called for close monitoring of security and other state affairs in case there's a resumption of nuclear tests. He did not specifically mention by whom, but he presumably meant North Korea. President Yoon once again highlighted the importance of national unity as part of everyday politics. And he emphasized social benefits and care for marginalized people, saying freedom is compatible with social welfare. Meeting with his senior secretaries, the president stressed the need to work closely together without barriers, which he said is the reason he relocated and rearranged the presidential office. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. As Yoon emphasizes thawing frost relations with Japan, he held a second meeting with the Japanese delegation, this time with members of the country's parliament. He shared his vision to improve bilateral ties. Kim Doen brings the highlights from that session. President Yoon song yeol has again showed his determination to repair South Korea's badly damaged relationship with its neighbor Japan, meeting on Wednesday for a second time with Japanese officials who attended his inauguration. Yoon's first meeting with a Japanese official the day before was with Japanese Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi, with whom he affirmed a shared goal of improving bilateral ties. This meeting, though, was with members of Korea-Japan Parliamentarians Union led by Fukushiro Nukaga of Japan's Liberal Democratic Party. In yesterday's speech, you noted the crisis of liberal democracy, and I think the audience must have been deeply moved by your statement that Korea will actively fulfill its international responsibilities based on universal values. Nukaga added that he met with Prime Minister Fumio Kishida before he came to Seoul, 
and that the Prime Minister also said he wants to improve relations. Yoon's approach to Tokyo has been a hot topic of late because the bilateral relationship has been at its worst point in decades over sensitive historical issues. And with the change of government, Yoon has said it needs to improve for both countries' sake. He and Nukaga also agreed to start with expanding people-to-people -people exchanges. One idea was restoring visa-free travel, along with direct flights between Kimpo and Haneda airports, which have been suspended since March 2020. Yoon's meeting with Nukaga was just one of many he had on Wednesday to thank guests who attended his inauguration representing their countries. Others he met with included dignitaries from Indonesia, Canada, Saudi Arabia, and the President of the Central African Republic. He met the day before with the delegates from the United States and China. Kim Do-yeeon, Arirang News. The government will submit an extra budget to the National Assembly to provide relief payments for small businesses hit by the pandemic. The administration and the ruling party agreed on the size and will seek to get it passed before the month is up. Yi gyeong reports. The Yoon suk yeol administration is pushing for the second extra budget of the year. The size of the budget? At least 33 trillion Korean won or roughly 26 billion U.S. dollars. The government and the ruling People Power Party decided on this on Wednesday, just a day after Yoon took office. We requested that the government ensures that the budget includes for each small business 6 million won in COVID-19 relief payments and 100% compensation for individual losses caused by the restrictions. That means each business will get roughly 4,700 U.S. dollars. And they'll get more compensation than before when payments reflected only 90% of their losses. The minimum compensation they can get has also doubled to roughly $800. Sectors like tourism, the arts and the airline industry will be included this time as well. And to cushion the impact of soaring consumer prices, the government is going to give up to 1 million won in emergency relief funds to households in the low-income bracket. As for how to pay the extra budget, Finance Minister Chu kyung ho has ruled out issuing additional national bonds. We adjusted spending expenditures and used all available resources, such as surpluses in the budget and at the central bank. Prime Minister nominee Han dok su was not at the meeting due to a delay in parliamentary approval. And Chu, whose role doubles as deputy PM, will be serving as acting PM for now. The government will announce more details about the budget at a cabinet meeting on Thursday. But eyes are on how the bill will get passed once it is handed over to the National Assembly. For a swift passage, the People Power Party requires cooperation from the now main opposition Democratic Party, which continues to hold a majority in the National Assembly. Lee kyung Arirang News. Seoul's new finance chief took office. In his inaugural address, Chu kyung ho emphasized the need to curb inflation and cut red tapes to aid growth led by the private sector. Um Jung shares with us his remarks. The Yoon administration's economic team is now in place, led by the new finance minister, Chu kyung ho Chu was officially inaugurated on Wednesday as Minister of Economy and Finance, a role where he'll double as deputy prime minister. As a former vice finance minister and head of financial policy at the Financial Services Commission, Chu played a key role in designing Yoon's major economic policies. In his inaugural address, he shared his views of the economic challenges Korea faces, both at home and abroad. He emphasized the need to stabilize prices and people's livelihoods as the top priority, saying the government should come up with policies to provide relief to those hit by the pandemic. To do this, Chu said, the government will immediately form an emergency economic task force to closely monitor and counteract economic challenges. Chu also said the cycle of low economic growth should be broken by a revitalization led by the private sector. And he called for drastic reforms of regulations to help companies create more quality jobs. 
Stronger policies are needed also, he said, to address other economic issues including Korea's low birth rate, aging society and regional imbalances, and to protect the socially vulnerable. Om ji Arirang News. President Yoon nominated a former Deputy National Security Advisor to lead the National Intelligence Service. Kim Kyu-hyun entered the Foreign Service in 1980 and served in various posts dealing with issues related to the South Korea-U.S. alliance. The career diplomat then served as Vice Foreign Minister and Senior Presidential Secretary for Foreign Affairs under the Park Geun-hye administration. Like other minister-level officials, Kim will go through a parliamentary confirmation hearing. Former NIS official and diplomat Kwon chun Tech is tapped to serve as his deputy. There are growing concerns North Korea is preparing to conduct a nuclear test in the next few weeks. Seoul's new defense minister vowed to respond sternly to the regime's provocations. Pei Eun-ji tells us more. South Korea's new defense minister Lee jong sop took office Wednesday and said the country will sternly respond to North Korea's provocations. During his inauguration speech at the nation's defense ministry in Seoul, he said as Pyongyang continues to advance its nuclear and weapon capabilities, it poses a serious threat to the Korean peninsula and regional security. If North Korea goes ahead with a tactical provocation, we will respond sternly based on our right to self-defense. Also, we will counter North Korea's nuclear and missile threats by strengthening the three-axis defense system. The three-axis system refers to the South Korean military's response to North Korea's missile attacks. It consists of three programs. One, preemptively striking North Korea's nuclear and missile sites. Two, intercepting the North's missiles. And three, mass retaliation against North Korea following an attack on the South. He also vowed to strengthen the military alliance with the U.S. and said he'll expand cooperation with allies in the defense field. This comes as the U.S. State Department's principal deputy spokesperson said last week that Washington assesses that Pyongyang is preparing to conduct a nuclear test as early as this month. If the North does conduct a nuclear test, it'd be the regime's seventh such test and the first one in nearly five years. Meanwhile, a top U.S. intelligence official has also warned that North Korea continues to produce fissile materials, including plutonium and uranium, for nuclear weapons. In a global threat assessment report submitted to the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee before a budget hearing, Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines explained that Kim Jong-un remains strongly committed to expanding the regime's nuclear weapons arsenal and continuing ballistic missile research and development. Pei eun Arirang News. Local authorities reviewed declaring COVID-19 as endemic and moving closer to a return to normal life. This would mean further easing of virus measures, including the removal of mandatory quarantine for confirmed patients. Kim Jian brings the updates. South Korea reported 43,925 daily new coronavirus cases on Wednesday, the second straight day is stayed above the 40,000 level. Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency said there were 383 critically ill patients, down 15 from a day earlier. 29 COVID-related deaths were recorded, marking a 0.13 percent fatality rate. South Korea's daily new infections have been on the downward trend since mid-March, after a peak of over 620,000. So the new Yoon so government is trying to push forward toward a return to pre-pandemic normalcy. South Korea eased the country's outdoor mask mandate last Monday and downgraded the virus for class 2 infection from class 1 on March 25th. The Ministry of Health and Welfare said Wednesday it will discuss next week whether it will proceed with the government's plans to officially declare the number of coronavirus cases as having plateaued or is in steady decline on May 23rd, indicating COVID-19 has become endemic in the country. One of the conditions is recording fewer than 100,000 daily infections, which would allow the medical system to readily provide treatment for confirmed patients. During the transition, there will be a complete reorganization of neighborhood hospitals and clinics to enable in-person treatment. The current system is convoluted and ineffective, divided into facilities that provide checkups and those that offer treatment. During the next 100 days, the ministry will unveil plans to carry out some of the coronavirus response measures released by the President Yoon's Transition Committee last month to prepare for a post-pandemic regime.
This includes revamping coronavirus response measures based on scientific evidence, establishing sustainable infectious disease response measures, the protection of vulnerable groups of people in the low-income bracket, and the procurement of safe vaccines and coronavirus treatments. Kim ji Arirang News. Elsewhere around the world, Shanghai logged one of its lowest COVID-19 tallies since authorities put the city under lockdown six weeks ago. 1,487 new cases down by more than half of Monday's figures. This was the first time in 16 days that the daily COVID-19 figure was in the 1,000 range. Beijing is also grappling with the virus. Over 800 buildings are being inspected under lockdown. Accordingly, the capital will temporarily close off major tourist attractions and its biggest shopping centers. For the first time in 14 years, diesel is more expensive than gasoline here in South Korea. According to industry data on Wednesday, the average price of diesel is 1,947 Korean won per liter, a little over a dollar and five cents. This is one and a half one higher than gasoline. Pundits linked the spike to the Russia-Ukraine war and recent fuel tax cuts. South Korea posted its biggest job growth in over two decades last month. Experts believe it's largely thanks to continued government support for workers and businesses, as well as the economic recovery. Lee ji helps us look beyond the digits. Things might be looking up on the employment front in South Korea. Some 865,000 people found jobs in April, the largest on-air increase for the month since the year 2000. Thanks to robust exports and more industries shifting to non-contact business operations, the number of employed people rose in April while the jobless rate dropped. The jobless rate fell one percentage point on year, the lowest for the month of April since 1999. And by age, those 60 and older found the most new jobs, adding over 400,000 positions on year. However, experts are cautious about predicting more positive figures going forward. Whether this trend will continue next month, we'll have to wait and see. We have to take into account the lingering uncertainties in the global economy, the war between Russia and Ukraine, as well as the decision in May to do away with social distancing in Korea. Watchers say it's a mixed bag for the domestic economy for the time being. Although it seems to be on a recovery track, it still faces soaring energy prices and global uncertainties. Lee ji Arirang News. Top U.S. intel officials fear Russia may use nuclear weapons against Ukraine if the conflict poses an existential threat. Moscow has yet to issue a response to Washington's remarks. Shin Yeun has the latest. The war in Ukraine is now in its 11th week. Many believe it'll go on even longer now that Russia has shifted most of its focus to eastern Ukraine. Specifically, the Donbas region, which includes two Russian-backed separatist republics in Luhansk and Donetsk. A top intelligence official in the U.S. predicts that Russia may go beyond capturing the Donbas region in eastern Ukraine. The President Putin would probably only authorize the use of nuclear weapons if he perceived an existential threat to the Russian state or regime. But we will remain vigilant in monitoring every aspect of Russia's strategic nuclear forces. Russia hasn't issued an official response, but on Monday, on its biggest patriotic holiday, Victory Day, solidified its stance that the war is to continue. Meanwhile, the U.S. House has passed a $40 billion bill to make it easier for Washington to provide humanitarian and military aid to Ukraine. President Joe Biden had urged the Congress to quickly approve this new bill as the world is paying close attention to whether the West will be able to expand its military alliance against Russia. Finland and Sweden are to decide this week whether to become NATO members. As the war rages on, the bodies of 44 civilians have been found in the rubble of a collapsed building in the city of Izium, which had been seized by Russia in early April. But Ukraine says it is stopping any further advances from Russian forces. Ukrainian troops also reportedly recaptured the settlements north and northeast of Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. Shin Yun, Arirang News. Shifting to a different story now, Alexa made history by becoming the first winner of NBC's American Song Contest. The event is comparable to Eurovision, where the contestants perform their original works. Jung Eun-ju gets us better acquainted with the K-pop star. K-pop singer Alexa has won the very first American Song Contest, a spinoff of Eurovision. Alexa beat nine other artists, including Grammy winner Michael Bolton. This is the first time a K-pop artist has won a large-scale audition show held in the United States. 
NBC's American Song Contest is a music competition that premiered in March this year and wrapped up its eight-week run on Monday, May 9th. Hosted by Snoop Dogg and Kelly Clarkson, 56 artists from U.S. states and territories competed against each other to win the title of Best Original Song. The voting process was similar to that of the Eurovision Song Contest, which combines professional jury points with public points to decide the winner. Alexa represented her home state, Oklahoma, and triumphed by receiving the highest score of 710 points with her song, Wonderland, a song she had performed in South Korea only on Arirang TV's Simply K-Pop show. Alexa scored especially high in the public vote category and said it felt like her brain had exploded when she heard the results. Alexa, whose full name is Alexandra Christine Schneiderman, is a K-pop singer based in South Korea. Her music career began in 2016 when appearing on the online audition show Rising Legends and rose to fame in 2018 as a contestant of Mnet's Produce 48. Her first single, Bomb, was released in 2019. Alexa had said on multiple occasions that she wanted to show people in the U.S. what makes K-pop. Jong Eun-ju, Arirang News. Koreans have a unique way of explaining one's age. This has caused a great deal of confusion to foreigners over the years. To solve this problem, there is currently a push to adhere to an international system. Ishii zooms in on the changes to come. In Korea, there are three ways of counting one's age. First, there is the universal age where babies are zero years old at birth and gain a year every birthday. This method has been the official way to count age in most legal definitions and administrations since 1962. Then, there is another official way called yonnai, or literally annual age, in which babies are also aged zero at birth but gain a year every January 1st. This method is used to define legal age for certain areas of law, such as military conscription or juvenile protection. And then there is senenai, or counting age, commonly known as Korean age. In this method, a baby is considered a year old at birth and gains a year every January 1st. For me, it's a little difficult because I have to count first. Uh, but I think it's an interesting way of counting your age, I think. It's uh, very special about Korea. There are many theories about the origin of South Korea's system of counting age, which in the past was also used in other countries, such as China and Japan. Experts say the lunar calendar used in Asia has had an influence. Using the lunar calendar, people's birthdays change every year. This made it easier to add a year to one's age every year instead of on a person's birthday. While other countries abandoned the system over time, the Korean language with honorifics made it difficult to do so. In case of the universal age, a person's age changes depending on the birthday, but that's not the case with the Korean age. Instead, everyone ages together on January 1st. This keeps the titles and honorifics consistent. But the coexistence of different age systems has caused confusion such as when dealing with COVID-19 vaccinations, Korea's wage peak system and insurance policies. That's why recently, the Presidential Transition Committee pushed for the widespread use of universal age. With one unified age counting system, it would be easier to figure things out. It would lessen confusion in contracts and administration and reduce associated social and economic costs. The Ministry of Government Legislation is planning to submit an amendment to the current General Act on Public Administration to the National Assembly within this year. This would define universal age as the official age system used in all legal and administrative matters and would also encourage its use in unofficial settings as well. Lee si Arirang News. Early summer-like warmth is forecast to take over across western parts of the country. So we'll see summer-like conditions with maximum temperatures of 28 degrees Celsius. This is what we normally see in early June, but eastern regions will be much breezier with readings hovering near 20 degrees. 
Big contrast and temperatures will continue for western regions. The Seoul metropolitan area, Chungcheongdo and Seollado provinces will see a difference of more than 10 degrees. To keep your body temperatures warm, wearing an extra layer will be recommended. And for Jeju Island and coastal regions of Gyeongsangdo province, light raindrops are expected. Murky skies will continue to dominate tomorrow. Seoul and Gyeongju will start off at 16 degrees. Daytime highs will be 2 to 5 degrees warmer than today. Daejeon and Chuncheon will get up to 27 degrees. Gyeongju and Busan will be breezy at 22 degrees. Temperatures will start to cool down on Friday, returning to the seasonal norms. Cloudy skies are in the forecast for the remainder of the week. That's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world. And that's all from us. As always, thank you for watching. Tradition and new beauty merge to create a bigger value.